Afternoon, everyone. Glad you all could join us and welcome to another installment of Lunchtime Lessons. Uh, for today's session, we are joined by Joe Del Tufo. Joe is a full-time professional photographer and he's the co-owner of Moon Loop Photography, which is a company that provides 360 virtual tours of businesses. Uh, he's currently working on a tour for Quorum here and I can say it looks fantastic and we're really excited to uh, share that with potential clients moving forward. Uh, but Joe is here today to share his passion for photography and some insight into taking great shots. Uh, as a large aspect of our culture has moved online over the past few years, amateur photography has become way more prevalent. Um, and especially considering how powerful our phones, cameras have gotten uh, during that time. Um, you know, Instagram and smartphones you know, make the photo editing process much more accommodating than traditional photography, uh, but they can't take a great shot for you. So that's why Joe's here today. Uh, he's going to be sharing a bunch of his own photography and discussing things you'll want to consider so you can get some great shots of your own. Uh, I've seen Joe's work um, that he'll be sharing throughout this presentation, and it's really quite stunning. So I'm excited to learn how he makes all that happen, and I'm sure you all enjoy it as well. So with that, Joe, you can take us away. Thanks a lot, Jake. So just a little bit about my background, as Jake mentioned, um, I'm one of the owners of Moonloop Photography that um, Jim Course and myself started five years ago. Um, I've been a photographer, a professional photographer for 20 years. Um, the original background is interesting in that I was, at, I, I was the owner of a design firm and really we couldn't afford the stock photography that was out there for things like websites. So uh, I decided to teach myself. So I have no formal education. So all of these things that I'll be teaching are things I've stumbled into and learned along the way. So they may or may not work for you, but they're definitely working for me pretty well. Um, I'm, I'm also not one kind of photographer. I shoot weddings, I shoot portraits, I shoot events, I shoot you know, 360s and VRs now. So <laughs> there's, there's all of those things. Um, but I mean, I really come from wanting to shoot things that interest me and really trying to focus on things like that. And I think that helps me drive what I do. Um, what I'm gonna show you, pretty much everything can be done on a smartphone and I'll definitely talk about anywhere that that's not the case. Um, the, the, limit, the, you know, the limitations of smartphones are typically fast action, um, low light and depth of field. They, they can do them, you have to have the right apps. Um, they're not anywhere near as good as an SLR for those things, but it is possible to do them and I will talk about that as well. Um, let's see, can anyone out there tell me what they consider the biggest benefit of the smartphone camera? Anyone? I'll go. Go ahead. I think the biggest benefit is being able to capture things in the moment without having to make sure you have a camera with you. That's very true. That's very true. I think for me, I would put it that it's something you always have with you. You know, for myself, I typically try to have my SLR with me as much as possible, but the reality of that is that's about half the time. And when you stumble into moments in life, I feel like I feel like having having a phone like that is an incredible advantage that we really didn't have anywhere near to this level five or six years ago. So let me show you, I'm gonna share my screen here really quickly. Okay, so this image here, hopefully you can see this now, is something, um, my business partner Jim and I were on an entirely different shoot. We were just kind of bouncing around um, the state and we ran into this early one morning and it's, it's a fog bow. And it's, it's a, basically a rainbow that's, that's lit through fog and it created that shape. I didn't have an SLR on me, so I took this shot with it. It was, I'm pretty happy with it for something that was taken early morning with a camera phone. But it's a shot that I, I still love. I love looking at. It's been printed in magazines and it's, you know, a number of my shots have been, a number of my uh, cell phone shots have run in magazines. And um, I don't tell people that because it doesn't really matter if they like the shot, it doesn't matter where it came from. And that's also part of what I'm hoping to, uh, hoping to share with you that, um, you know, the, the actual, you know, part of what I'm gonna talk about is the actual 
camera and lens that you're using and the, the things that you really need to spend money on, they're really nice to have. And as a professional, sometimes you have to depend on things working exactly in a specific way. But for 99.9% .9 of the people, you know, especially an iPhone, something like that, something with a decent, with a decent camera will get you there. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, let me go ahead and start with this. Let me know that everybody can see this and I'm going to go full screen with it if possible. All right. Can everyone see that? Yeah, it looks good. Good. All right. So I'm going to say something that not, not everyone is aware of, and it's my opinion, but I believe that light is more important than a camera or the lens that you're using. And, you know, here's, here's something that, you know, this is a wedding shot that I did and we do do a lot of weddings. So that's, that's something that always keeps me sharp. And the couple was really loving the fireflies that were out that night. So this was a very tricky shot and took us a long time to get, but using a very long exposure, I was able to backlight them, which freezes them, and then allow the, the fireflies to kind of move in into the space. And so that's, it was about a two second exposure in order to get it right. Um, and I feel like that was a, a unique way of getting that. So. I'm going to talk about different kinds of light and different ways that we can use them. Um, I want to talk about the quality of light, you know, the difference between hard and soft, between direct and reflected light, um, how we can backlight things for an effect, and the importance of color and shape. I'm actually going to pop back out really quick because I want to show you a couple things around that. Um, when I'm talking about light, I like to talk about how we can modify it. And for, for using things with a smartphone, even stuff like, like this, which is just a little portable light, is something that I always keep in my camera bag because it's, it's really cool for giving effects and different styles. But if you don't have that, um, you know, this is called a loom cube. They're, they're a little bit expensive for a little light, but even just a simple flashlight, sometimes I use, you can put a piece of paper over to soften it, you know, in a pinch, I'll even take someone else's smartphone and use it to light a portrait of someone in, in, a, in a restaurant or think, something like that. Um, more creatively, you know, we have, we have gels and things like this where you can actually color things in different ways. And we use these a lot in our professional work, but simple things that can give you a unique look. And I think, you know, in the, in the age of Instagram here where we're all taking photos and we're all taking photos often of the same things, finding a way to make them unique is often the challenge and that's what makes them stand out. And you know, one other thing I've got here, I've been playing with this. This is a, it's a, it's a turtle, but it's also a, it's also a, a prism, and I've actually been using this in ways to refract things in a unique way. This is just coming through my, my laptop, and I'll show you how I used this recently in another shoot. Um, but all of these are, you know, ways to work with light. And I've got, I don't know if you can see that, but in my, in the background, I've got a strobe that I use professionally, like. I've lit up an entire um, massive space using that, gelled it blue and came up with a really nice look for it. Um, these are incredible for big events, for weddings, for just being able to control light because we can't always control light. Um, all right, so let's get into some specifics about that, about light. All right. All right, so one of the things I learned early about light that's been helpful to me is to shoot the same thing in different light. Sometimes that means at different times of day. Sometimes that means at different angles. Sometimes that means I have to actually bring light and, and hit it with different types of light. So in this case, um, I am in window arch and arches in Utah. And this is what that looked like in the morning. It was, it was glorious heavenly light coming through it, soft and powerful. And, you know, we just basically shot this from the road. Um, we were on our way to walk through that to the other side where we got that. And that involves some climbing to get to there, but basically to shoot through that arch from the other angle with the sun at the other way and how different that looks. And then later that night, I believe it was the same day, um, we ended up getting this. So this was, this was just a, a straight up night shot, nothing special about it other than putting a camera on a tripod um, you're starting to get the ability to do these in smartphones. I know that the Google one um, is doing a really impressive job with long exposure photography. And again, my point, my point here is that, you know, basically it's the same space. 
dramatically different shots at different times. And, you know, I'll also mention to you that, you know, this is something, this is something you should be able to, when you're, when you're thinking about the photo that you're taking, thinking about how turning somebody around in different light, you know, different available light can actually change the quality of that light and the quality of that shot. So this is an example of light that only appears at a certain time. I think it was right, you know, it was high noon. This is an Antelope Canyon, um, this Arizona. And basically there's a small opening at the top of the slot canyon. And when the sun's pointing right down on it, you get that nice stream of light and you get this really remarkable look to it. Uh, it only occurs for a few minutes, but it's a pretty cool thing to know about. You know, so similarly here, and I'm going to talk about a lot of places I've been because I think some of those shots show diversity, but most of most of my photos and most of my best photos are really things that I've taken locally here because um, that's where I spend most of my time. But this was in Banff. This was on a, this was just a personal holiday that we took. And that's my daughter, Alex. And so when I placed her where I placed her, the idea was that the light would reflect a little bit and be soft and not be a silhouette because we're basically inside of a cave. So where she was there, I could get enough of her and still get the beautiful framing of the misty light. There's a waterfall off to the left and that massive rock in the middle. And it all balanced out nicely. It's one of those things that it was just, it just all worked out. It was the right time of day, which obviously I can't control, but I can control it, but I couldn't control it in this case. But um, anyway, that's, that's that light. So here's an example of creating light, something we do in our professional work. And you know, this is not, not something that's easy to do with a smartphone, but if you had continuous light, you could do that. In this case, we're in pitch dark here, and I put two lights, two very strong lights, like the strobe that's behind me, um, behind them in order to get this beautiful tree that was gonna be the frame for them. And very happy how that one turned out. And this is, this is you know, half a mile from my house. It's really, really close by. You know, that, that also brings up the point that sometimes knowing what's around you and knowing what's possible is great. So when you have the opportunity to say, bring a couple to that space and make that really something that it's all in your head. And similarly, um, similar type of shot, but in this case, I added color to it. Literally the gels that I showed you earlier through the, through the camera here. Um, but in this case, I don't have two lights. I've got five or six lights and I'm using different colors behind them to light up this beautiful space. Um, in this case, the only thing that was actually lit behind them was were the columns. So this gave things a lot of dimension and really goes against the trend of front lighting people. So there's no light on the front of them. The only light that you see on them is stuff that's wrapped around them from what I've created. So that's all, that's all kind of complex stuff and I'll get back into more simple stuff. Um, in this case, I've got, a, I've got a light artist. That's what he does, Warren at Badibadoo in Philadelphia. He's, he's remarkable. All of the light behind him is his own light. This is his work and what he's created. So I posed him in front of it. And the only light that I have created myself is the light on his face. And there's a blue light below him. And why I added blue to that was I like the, I liked the way it kind of closed the loop on the color of his shirt and the one piece in his work so that there are three pieces of light that connect in a certain way. And then this vibrance of warmth that is his work, that's the main point of it behind him. And he's used this as his portrait professionally for you know, a few years now since it was taken. So again, age of Instagram, we're all, we're all taking the same photos of often the same places, often the same way. So I think what makes things stand out um, is, is asking ourselves how to see things differently. And this is something I am, I am a short person. So I've often seen things differently than most people. I, I come from a slightly lower angle and I learned some things from that. So I exaggerate that. Sometimes I'll take things flat on my stomach now and I'll show you some examples of that. And sometimes I'll climb very high in this case, way up above everything to get the sunset. And I was actually looking for puffins in this space. This was in Iceland a couple of years ago, um, but I really loved the way the sunset looked here and you wouldn't have gotten this feel from, from down below. So let's go through that. Shooting above things. So this is um, my business partner, Jim and I were on our way to an engagement shoot in New Jersey. So we took the ferry over 
And when I was looking down, down on the fairy, it was, it was pressing the water in such an interesting way. It struck me as almost like an aerial photo, almost like something you might see from a satellite. So this is just the water below the ferry. But straight down, I thought it looked really interesting and, and unique. And it's just something that, that stood out for me. So I like shooting straight down on things. And you know, here's an example. This is, this is from a, a place I was at in Montana. And I wanted to capture, I wanted to basically make a present for the person who let me use the space there, which is right below there. And I tried a, a number of shots and nothing was really working out. It just looked like a lot, a lot of Milky Way shots that I've seen. But climbing up the hill in the pitch dark with my tripod and, and trying not to break my legs um, was a fun challenge in order to get this shot that worked out nicely. To me, it gave more gravity to the shot and a more unique perspective than I would have normally taken. Similarly, this is, this is kind of a compli complicated ex explanation, but um, this is Smithbridge in Delaware. If you've, been, if you've been in the Wilmington area and seen Smithbridge, it's actually red. Um, I shot it. I shot it in infrared. I was up in helicopter because when we're doing helicopter shoots, we always pay for a little bit of extra time to take interesting and creative shots. And what I wanted to show here was how different that bridge looked from this angle. We're all used to driving through it. It's got a very specific look. Um, and I wanted to show how it really was very much an architectural feel, how it carved itself into that water and how balanced it actually could be because you never see it that way from the ground. So this was for a poster for, um, for City Theater Company. We did a whole series of all of these posters that, that season were done from above. That was the style that we were going for. Um, this is again, my daughter and she's surrounded by Beatles albums cause it was a Beatles play. And I shot it from above in the house on a ladder and the tripod was connected. I mean, the camera was connected to a tripod and literally hovered over her as, as well as I could hold it still. And I had somebody else clicking the clicking the shutter in order to uh, remotely clicking the shutter in order to get this nice balanced shot, and no one got hurt. So that was that all worked out nicely. And then below, sometimes shots from below have interesting feels to them. And obviously, for something like this, where we have where we have someone flying through the air on a skateboard, the the tension of that and the, you know, basically the feel of it is entirely different. This was July. I was burning up on this shot. We were on, we're literally on the road. I am literally on my back shooting up at him. Um, but it was worth it. Ended up in a, out and about magazine that year. And it's a shot that I got some awards for. I don't remember exactly what they were. Some um, publicity, I mean, not publicity, but basically some um, journalism awards for. Um, so this was, this was, I'm going to show some recent shots um, you know, during the quarantine because I've been out doing things that are different than what I normally do. And this was one of them that was really an amazing thing to experience. This is the Black Lives Matter protest and Kobe Owens was marching a lot of people down the street. Um, I got up ahead of it and again, got flat, flat on my stomach and shot up at him. And the reason for that was to show something different, but also to show the intensity and the power and the energy that I was feeling, um, not having video, a lot of that energy goes away in a still image and you really need to find ways to tell that story differently. Um, shooting way above it would have had a different feel, would have, would have shown you know, even more people. But here I'm going for something specific and I'm very happy with how it turned out. Similarly, from below, this is a Canadian band called the Glorious Sons, and we're in we're in the forest of the Firefly Music Fest, which would be happening right now if life were normal. Um, but so that I really like how this turned out. I used a really wide lens. I have my own light below it, and the light is bouncing down, straight down, and then back up at them in order to light them up in, in an even way. Um, this is something they've used that they were very happy with. Um, just just a fun, fun shot, something different. Again, just trying to make things unique. So getting closer to things, macro shots. Some, you have some degree of doing macro shots, especially with, um, with add-on lenses on, on phones. And this is an aphid up really close. 
this is not any really high-end lens. It's a pretty cheap lens that I've got that I use for it. And I feel like it gives decent results. I'm not a professional macro photographer, but I do take a lot of close-ups of like wedding rings and things like that. So having these skills and being aware that that's an option is always, is always cool. Same thing with a snowflake. Didn't realize snowflakes looked quite like that up close, but that is my, that is my glove holding a snowflake. Same lens that I was using for the aphid. Um, a little bit more challenging to hold that still, but it turned out pretty nicely. And um, I've printed this and sold a lot of copies to people and have a lot of other things along these lines. But again, it makes things, it makes you see things a different way, which is really, really the, the, the number one goal in my opinion. Um, depth of field is another thing that is something that is somewhat challenging on, on a phone. You know, certain things like portrait mode help with that, but there's, you know, it's hard to beat, you know, a very fast lens on an SLR. In this case, I'm shooting at a 1.4 lens. This is the Clifford Brown Music Festival, which is happening remotely this year, which is going to be cool. But I'm, I am focused on the trumpet instead of focusing on the artist, which is not the first thing you think of, definitely. My first few shots in the series were of the artist. And then I thought, well, what if I did this and shot it at very shallow depth of field? And this is something that is now hanging in the visitor center of Wilmington, which I'm happy, happy to see printed large. And it's definitely something I think about when I'm shooting because my mind is always, all right, what else can I do differently? How can I make this look more interesting? How can I tell the story in a different way? Another thing I really like to do is um, look at shadows and look at reflections. Again, not the thing you think of first, but something that's slightly different. So in this case, this is the Arden Fair here locally, and it was just someone walking with balloons. And I thought, what a fun way of showing that. Similarly, this is, um, this is, uh, it's not Ocean City, where were we here? We were at, we were at the Taj Mahal in, in, um, in, in uh, New Jersey. And I'm up a few flight, flights with a telephoto lens and um, this bicyclist, bicyclist comes along in the boardwalk and I shot it with the long, the long morning shadow and then flipped this so that the shadow is seen first. Again, just two different things, both the angle and time of day and, and the fact that then the image is flipped to give a different feel to it. But again, that's, that's about recognizing the shadow before you recognize the subject. And, you know, reflections work a, a similar way. This is the right after a wicked storm that we had here in Arden, in Arden, Delaware. Uh, the sun came out, it brought a rainbow with it. And of course, my first two thoughts were, let's, let's find a rainbow and then let's find a way to shoot it. Um, but I quickly found that the massive puddle from the storm told a different story and was almost celestial. It almost looks like a night shot to me in terms of how it turned out. And again, this is again something that can easily be done on a cell phone once you recognize the opportunity for it. Um, Sagrada Familia, this amazing basilica in uh, Barcelona, Spain. I got up early before all the people I was traveling with um, were up and very early in the morning because I wanted to get a shot of this without a lot of people around it and without a lot of, without a lot of cars and, 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 and whatnot. And I had to do a little bit of trespassing to get to this angle, but it worked, I think it worked out pretty well. And uh, if you've seen the Sagrada Familia, it does have cranes and whatnot all over it right now. It's under a lot of construction and I did remove those for this shot, but this, this I feel like still works that way. And, this is one of maybe two images, and I'll, I'll explain the other one to you as well, where I, uh, I did some photoshopping for the most part. These are all pretty much out of camera with, um, with color and contrast changes in Lightroom. So here I've got, um, I've got this is at a music festival called Nearfest, and I was, I was basically trying to find a way to capture Keith Emerson Emerson Lake and Palmer in a different way than he'd been captured. And I was shooting around him during sound check, which is why I was able to get so close. And I finally just decided to get right up in, in his space and capture a reflection of him that also captured his hands because his hands are so much part of his work. 
And I feel like this, this was a very unique thing. I've shot, I don't know, probably four or 5,000 concerts over the years. It's something that I really come from. And I feel like this was a rare opportunity to capture something that was different though than I was doing over the years and something that I'm proud of. Silhouettes. Silhouettes are something that I often look for opportunities for. Um, this one's from our town here on July 4th. We um, opened up the fire hoses and, and spray the kids with them, which is a blast. And the water flies everywhere and the light flies everywhere. And you know, the one thing about silhouettes is if you open your shutter speed up high enough in bright light, you can typically get a silhouette of just about anything, as long as you're, as long as you're facing the light in the right angle. Um, and this was a kid in town and he had, had the right pose and the right shot. And again, I feel like the color versions I was getting before I took this pale in comparison to what this ended up being. You know, similarly, um, my business partner, Jim, kind of was, uh, before the wedding we were shooting in uh, Barbados, we went on a little trip around, around the island just to get a feel for it and ended up in a cave. And this shot came from that, again, just silhouettes of people swimming in the cave and, and looking over the edge of the, of the ocean. Uh, definitely another one of those things where the silhouette, when I saw this, when I saw the light behind them, which would have been pure white if you had shot it at a regular exposure, um, when I, once I brought it down to something more sh shootable, was also much more interesting. So this was from a recent protest after um, here in Wilmington, and after some damage had been done to some of to the local stores. I was, I was basically, I actually went there to help um, with some of the, some of the um, restaurants that I have from friends who run, uh, but I also went, walked around and took pictures of it and just tried to capture some of the things that I saw. And what, what I want you to see here isn't necessarily the broken glass or even, or even the reason why the glass is broken. What you, what I saw in there was a pattern. And if you can look, you can see, um, you can see that there are two eyes what looks like a sad face. Um, two eyes where the windows are and sort of a sad face on the, on the bottom of it that to me was really reflective of the whole situation. So I'm often looking for things within things, uh, especially when I do architectural work. Not that this is architectural work per se, but um, I always look for interesting patterns that show balance and, and humanity, frankly, in it. And I'll give you another example of that. This is something that I really liked that, you know, it's, when you look at it, you think it's something from a, a Stanley Kubrick film, maybe it's some futuristic tunnel that's gonna take you at 300 miles an hour to some city far away. But the reality of it is it's just, it's just a SEPTA station in Philly. And the SEPTA station, you know, I lit it from behind. I'm, I'm there because I'm shooting a band and I'm gonna shoot them on the stairs. But when I saw that, it struck me that, that you know, there's, some very cool things you can do with those patterns. And that, that is sort of a way of thinking that to me starts, starts a conversation with yourself about creativity that I, I enjoy. It keeps photography interesting for me always. I look at things differently. I appreciate things differently. Uh, it allows me to think about maybe the person that put this very basic thing together and what their thoughts were and, and their balance and that, and to basically appreciate to appreciate the creativity that they put into something that's relatively standard. Um, so in this case, um, talk, you know, basically I wanna show you this as a way of saying, one of the things I always carry in my camera bag is a polarizer. And you can get little clip on polarizers for, for your phone, but this shot, that, that rainbow does not show up like that without a polarizer. So understanding how light can be twisted in order to bring those colors out makes what would be a really good shot into a great shot because you know that you can bring out the things you want to you want to show in it. And if you're wearing polarized sunglasses, it's terrible because if you don't have the polarizer, then you, what you saw is nothing near what you end up getting in your camera. So double exposures are another way to manipulate light and you can do incredible things with double exposures. Um, I'll talk about a couple apps later on that you can do them in on your phone, but this is, none of this is done with a phone. Um, this is just a regular double exposure. And this is a Richard Raw. 
amazing musician, activist in town. And we were doing a bunch of shots for an album cover. This didn't end up being the cover, but it's ending up being something he used. And for this, the double exposure was such that I took a regular shot. And for the double exposure, I did a slower shutter shot with a little bit of a zoom in it to create the layer above him. And it was the first time that I had done this and I liked how it turned out and I've done it a number of times since then, sometimes even during live shows, just to give a different feel to something. Excuse me for a second to grab a little bit of water. Another double exposure and this one has a little bit of Photoshop to it to clean it up. And this is um, a guy named Robin Hitchcock, pretty famous British musician. And you know, basically photo, uh, photoshopped a little bit of the angles of it, but pretty much a double exposure where I had his hands over his face and then his hands not over his face. So these are the twin poets here in Delaware. They, they are po our poet laureates and they're amazing if you've gotten a chance to see them, just remarkable, remarkable beat poets. And I wanted to try to capture them since they're twins capture them in an interesting way. So I flipped them in different directions for double exposure and tried to capture some of the light. I think this is probably a triple exposure. Try to capture some of the light of the city that was right behind them. It's right on Market Street in Wilmington. So this is an even more complex way. Uh, this was this was in um, in Dublin last year and I wanted to trap try to capture this frantic energy of of people coming down this, this street here. And instead of doing a double exposure, I ended up doing, this is a five or six X exposure and just basically shaking the camera as I was doing it. So nine times out of 10, that, that creates complete garbage. But every now and then I would get something like this. I got like five shots that really showed it. And you know, in this case, um, the woman on the bottom with the ice cream cone. And I've got another one that looks like something out of Mr. Robot. Um, they just revealed something that I was trying to reveal in a very sort of out of control way in an out of control situation. And I, I feel like it told the story in a very unique way. And I do that a lot. I, I try this technique a lot when I feel a lot of energy in motion. Try to probably should have tried it during one of the, um, one of the recent protests, but it didn't occur to me. <laughs> um, so this is one I showed you that I showed you that turtle earlier that has all the prisms on it. And this is literally shot out of camera um, with that. This is all of the, all that is is putting the turtle in front of the camera and um, yeah, you know, basically capturing capturing James Wyatt, who's a painter here, as he's he's actually painting up the board the the the, the windows that were broken in the city have been boarded up. And the ones that are going to stay boarded for a while, we're, we're basically trying to get those painted with something beautiful on it, um, using black artists as a way of, of showing some kind of balance and showing some kind of beauty um, and positivity out of a difficult situation. So this is literally an iPhone photo. And all this is, is I, I took a pair of scissors and cut a bamboo stalk and put the camera lens through the middle and shot it at the sun. And it shows the, 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 um, the inside of the bamboo in, in a unique way. And just again, how do we see light? How do we see light differently? And how do we use light, or, you know, basically use our understanding of light to create beauty? All right, so how to deal with action. This is, this is pictures a whole other story, which hopefully I'll be able to tell soon, but pretty much um, it caught up with me, ended up on top of me and everything went fine. It was, it was kind of a managed situation, but maybe we'll do a different talk about that sometime. Um, action, fast shutter speed is important for action. This is probably the photo of mine that's been seen by the most people because the Philadelphia Flyers used it on their Jumbotron and it hung in the, in the locker room for a while. But using fast shutter burst mode on your phone, things like that during fast action will capture things like this where it's very difficult to time it on your own. So this was shot at around 10 frames per second and got the right frame. And that's what I was looking for. Similarly for this, Rob Pfeiffer, a brewer, he's got some hops that he's pretty much throwing at me. They're very expensive. We didn't want to waste them. So I wanted to get this right the first time. 
Um, again, shot very high shutter speed. I'm lighting it from the behind him to try to create the energy that we're looking for. And his expression tells the story. Similarly, high shutter speed here. And this is just, this is just a fountain with the sun behind it. I saw a rainbow in it, but by shooting it at higher shutter speed, I was able to freeze the individual droplets. In this case, I'm probably at like one five hundredth, one one thousandth of a second. Again, these are things that some, some apps will let you pretty much set this, you know, the shutter speed for. Pretty tough to get this with an app, I think, but who knows, I haven't tried it. Um, but I like how that looks as a way of showing how a rainbow can look differently. Similar type of thing, I wanted to capture the, um, the header uh, that Obama did um, with the LA Galaxy behind him after they had won the championship. And again, eight frames per second and I have some options to play with. I like the expressions and, and the ten tension that the uh, soccer ball over his head created here. So high shutter speed, but also panning. I am moving with, with the owl here in order to get the background out of focus. This is something that would be really tricky to do with a phone um, for a number of reasons, but it's something that when you're trying to get something like this to capture the energy of it is a, is a neat technique. So this is very similar to what I showed you at the beginning about the fireflies and slow shutter in order to show their motion and their energy and their light. Another slow shutter, um, Italian festival here locally. This is on a tripod, obviously, for something this long, but again, very, very much more interesting than what it would have been just freezing it with a normal shot. A uh, recent one I shot for the 76ers Fieldhouse, they illuminated a lot of, a lot of parts of the city in blue. And that was, um, this was something where I wanted to try to capture something in the foreground that gave it some energy. So you're seeing streaks of cars there on something like a five second exposure. And again, you're seeing reflection in the foreground from an earlier range to kind of give it a different energy and feel to it. So here I'm doing slow shutter because I wanted you, I wanted you to see, I wanted the viewer to see how the sushi artist here actually works quickly and creatively um, to put this, this piece together and how slow shutter can be used for things you would normally think to use fast shutter for. You know, for boxing, it's, it's classically a fast shutter shoot. You know, but slow, slow shutter sometimes will show the energy. Again, this is something you shoot five or six times in order to get one that looks reasonable. Um, you need the right action and energy to make it look right. But here you, you get something that's got much more of a, a palpable feel to it. And with slow shutter, sometimes I play with things on the end. So this is say a 20 second exposure where maybe the last second or two, I'm zooming in a little bit and I'm changing the focus a little bit in order to get something that feels like it's coming at you. And similarly with, this is a fun thing to try on the 4th of July where you can put your camera on a tripod um, and basically put it on a long enough exposure that once the firework goes off, if you just change the focus on it a little bit, you can actually see the, gra the gradation of it from focus to out of focus, which can look like a flower. And this was something I was shooting for the background of an album cover and similar thing. All this is, is a, a, you know, a night shot, long exposure of Philadelphia where the last two or three seconds I'm zooming in to the city in order to create that motion forward. So I'll move through this quickly. We're kind of a little bit past time, but um, I wanted to talk briefly about what makes one image more interesting than another. You know, in this case, I want to show you something that's important to me, which is shooting in RAW, which um, smartphones can now do. This is something I shot specifically for this. I just shot this a few days ago. It's something that's going up in Wilmington right now. And this is how it came out of the camera. It looks decent it's on, a, on a smartphone, but bringing it into RAW and editing in Lightroom the app got me from here, from here to here. Simple stuff, but getting the colors, getting the balance of it right and making it pop a little bit, all stuff that took all of five seconds to do 
makes a big difference in terms of the professionalism of the image. I could, I could print that in the magazine and no one would bat an eyelash to it. This, not so much. Um, balance is important. This is a classic balanced image, Hurricane Ridge in Seattle, something I shot a long time ago when I was working on balance in my work. Similarly, even portraits can find balance, you know, creating the right frame for it, setting, um, this is John Gorka, the singer songwriter, setting him up in a, in a nice balanced fashion creates something that stands out versus something that doesn't have that. Even how you frame something, this same, you know, the arch in St. Louis has been shot so many times. I spent a lot of time looking for the right frame for it and then shot it in infrared as a way of attempting to make it different. Balance in, in a portrait is great. So here I've got something, you know, I was not raised on rule of thirds. This technically uses it here. But for me, I just thought her walking into the tension of the space, and this is something called the wave, um, also in Arizona, that's just unbelievably gorgeous. But the tension of her walking into the smaller part of the space to me was much more interesting than a standard, you know, center, center balance shot. And even just straight up, straight up balance, eyes on, you know, straight at you. This is not something that typically people would say is a good, is a good, you know, way of, of, of balancing something out. But for, for me, this worked. So always remember to break the rules as well. Similarly, this is not something jammed into one side for a great, great blue heron that people would say is a, is a classic way of doing things. But to me, it made it unique and different than how we would typically shoot, shoot birds. Uh, tension, tension in, in the shot is an important part of it. Um, Secretary of Labor here in Delaware, previous Secretary of Labor in, in Delaware. And I also put her facing the small side of, of the image, which created tension. And then we had her throwing the chalk up, which created tension. Again, creating something with balance and tension together that makes it interesting. Um, so here, hang on for one second. Here I want to talk about a different kind of light that I spend a lot of time working on, and this is infrared light. On the ends of the spectrums, we have infrared and ultraviolet. And this is an infrared shot of, of the basically the roller coaster that went down under hurricane during Hurricane Sandy. And I shot it in Fred again just to make it make it look a little bit different, a little bit more surreal because the situation was surreal and I found that the infrared version was much more interesting than the color version for me. And I wanted to show you how this is a very recent shot from Lum's Pond here in Delaware, how that looked in infrared versus the exact same shot in color. So cool shot in color much different, much more interesting, showing off the heat energy of the space in infrared light. And similarly, I wanna talk about ultraviolet light on the other end of the spectrum. So I've got some lights set up here that show ultraviolet light in this absolutely boring scenario. The situation is not something I would ever shoot in, but by adding the subject who is painted in, in ultraviolet light and lighting it in ultraviolet light, we get this. And there's absolutely no reason why you can't take this exact photo in ultra, you know, with, with your camera phone because a lot of people who were there when we shot this did and it looks very much the same. The pink light behind her is actually my normal pink light, but other than that, everything else would pop. So there's a number of smartphones, smartphone apps that I want to point out. Um, I pretty much use Moment for my shooting. And that's the one in the upper left. It's M-O-M-E-N-T, and it shoots raw, and it's got complete um, manual controls, just like my, my SLR camera. And I use that a lot, and it just works. It gives me a lot of flexibility. Um, on the bottom is a, is a and, and Moment costs a few dollars, but it's worth it. And below that, it's Lightroom, which is a free one, which does a lot of the sim similar types of things. Um, that's what I was using before Moment. It still works great. And if you want to try out something, try out your hand in raw for editing. That's, that's a good one to work with. And then I have Snapseed in the upper right, which is when I'm editing things, when I want to be creative, when I want to do double exposures, that's what I use. So that's basically it. That's, that's as many things as I can jam into 45 minutes or so that are little techniques that, that I like. And 
Um, so there's co some contact information here and um, Jake will actually um, also send the link to these slides so you can see them if you want to want to review them and see see if you can come up with some techniques and I'd love you know if you want to tag me or email me or just contact me with anything that you try that worked for you I'd love to see the images um, or if you do the opposite or if you try other things and you're experimenting if something made you think what if I did this I'd love to see that because that really is for me the essence of you know, the essence of what, what this is all about. So uh, from there on, I'd like to open this up to any questions you might have, questions about te techniques or other things, that, um, other things that we can capture. All right, cool. Thanks a lot, Joe. As I said in the beginning, those photos are stunning. Um, it looks like, and we have people singing your praises in the chat, and uh, we do have a couple questions here. Um, Linda asks, do you have any phone recommendations? <clears throat> I've only ever used an iPhone, but my understanding that people people strongly seem to agree with is that the Google phones have better cameras built into them. Um, I think, I mean, I think that's that's the general consensus right now. So if if, if you, you know, basically the camera part of your phone is the most important thing, I would look in that direction. Cool. And uh, Stephen asks, can you explain the IR process, please? Sure, there's basically two ways of doing IR. You can get a filter that you can screw onto it. I think that for, for if we're talking about um, camera phones still, I'm sure there is one out there. I've not actually seen it, but pretty much you can screw on a filter and then with, with a tripod, get basically the same types of shots that I'm showing. Um, there's a trick to showing, to keeping some of the color in it that I can go over, it's a little bit more complex but that's generally what it is. Or you can do what I do, which, actually, which is actually convert the camera itself to shoot only infrared, which will allow you to not have to be connected to a tripod. You can just shoot on the fly. And then it's a pretty wet, quick way to convert it in Lightroom to something that looks like what I'm showing you. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you again, Joe. That was awesome. And was thank you to you all for uh, joining us. As Joe mentioned, I will be sharing uh, the slideshow with you. So can uh, keep that as a, a source of inspiration for you. So uh, yeah, thank you everyone. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your days. We'll see you at the next session.